Welcome to the show, Pete Mortimer. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for having me, Jason. Yeah, great to see you again, virtually here. Yeah, great to um, be here. Pete, how do you describe yourself these days? Uh, filmmaker. Filmmaker, it. one word. I love it, that's so yeah. easy. <laughs> yep. Okay. <laughs> nice. And you're just for, because this is a relationship podcast, you're married with kids. Tell us just briefly bio. Yep. I live here in Boulder and I'm married to my wife, Jocelyn Corkin. And we have two kids. Pia is 12 and Zavi is nine. Such cute kids, man. I, I remember, I think the first time I met you was at the um, ABC climbing gym. Yep. I think, totally. and, you know, I had no idea, of course, you were a filmmaker, badass dude. Um, but we bouldered a little bit together, I think. And, and maybe, um, what's his name was there? Uh, ben. Yep. Exactly. Cause that was the connection, mutual kind of friend that anyway, it's been fun to run into your kids as they grow and they're just adorable and so cute and amazing. Awesome people like your kids, just yeah. so inspiring and the best. The yeah, best. completely. Love that. Well, today I'm, I'm just psyched to have, this is, you're my first filmmaker I've had on the show and people might be like, what the hell is a filmmaker doing on a relationship podcast? And I'll just briefly explain my intentions here. So the listener has a clue, which is to, um, I'm fascinated by, uh, being a former rock climber. I, I barely rock climb these days. Um, so I call myself kind of a former rock climber. And also extreme athlete, as well as someone who, as a therapist, saw many climbers and mountaineers in my practice here in Boulder and getting into the psychology and some of the trauma and the issues that climbers have in relationships. I was fascinated whenever I watch your films, I'm just like, oh my God, um, like the alpinist really just rocked my world. Um, just how, how in there you got with uh, the main character and... We'll talk about that film. So that's part of my intention. I also, because you're such a brilliant creator, I, I thought I, I have just a couple creative questions for you, maybe toward the end that um, the creators listening would love to hear your answers to. Oh, yeah, great. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I saw a number of, cli I think where I want to start is I saw a number of climbers um, and mountaineers and in living in Boulder 20 years, I've, I've seen people die also, right? I haven't seen them die, but you know what I mean? Like there's been many deaths yeah. over the years. And, and one has to ask the obvious question is like, why do guys do this? Why do these people go out and risk their lives? And um, it seems crazy. And what, what is your answer to that? Why do these climbers in particular push it so hard and go it alone so often to the edge? Yeah. Yeah, and it's guys and, and, and girls, too. I mean, it's right. not. Right. I think, I mean, I have close relationships with a lot of climbers who have really pushed it out there and, and do. And on, on the one hand, I think it's really individual and so unique and different. Um, on the other hand, it's all seeking the same sort of thing which is just this deeper experience. I think mm. this more, I mean, I think if you had to distill it down, it's just, a. it's what is appealing <laughs> about doing it is just a more pure immersive experience and everything that offers, which is a more focused mindset, a more um, just heightened awareness of your senses and, mm a deeper connection with the world that you're exploring and a it's, you know, an easier to get rid of all the distractions. And, you know, I mean, I think we all have that, like you can go swimming or you can, you know, play tennis or whatever it is. And we all have that to varying degrees and, you know, even reading a book and, and just getting into that. And it's something, but I think, that these people who are doing it on this deeper level are just, it, it's, they're just going further and further in that direction. Yeah. And it seems like also you're kind of describing maybe a, a peak experience or a flow state. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Right. 
Yeah. And I know when I was climbing, I, I climbed a lot in my twenties and I, I felt like I had a lot of problems and I, I used a lot of drugs and alcohol. And when I was climbing, I was always sober and I got very present and it just helped me like leave the world behind and leave my problems behind. Yeah. Is that also, you said kind of eliminate the distractions. It seems like there's a lot of climbers that I've worked with anyway, and, and sort of some of the movies sort of, you could kind of get this from your films as well. When you get into the minds of the climbers is they're, they're sort of troubled in a way and, and yeah. by whatever their past or how stressful life can be sensitive they are and they just like look climbing is kind of an escape for some yeah i mean it's interesting because climbing has evolved so much in the last i mean i started climbing at fairview high school when i was you know 15 16 wow. yeah. and um it was such a fringe sport then and we actually had a climbing class at fairview back then as uh -huh. an alternative to gym class and the people who gravitated to that were just like the total freaks and outcasts. <laughs> right. And there were a bunch of guys who were like st wrestling with drugs. And, um, you know, it was just, it really was this like alternative um, lifestyle yeah. that I think like was, it was a community and it was a fringe community and it was a counterculture. And I think that really saved a lot of people that I know growing up. Um, now yeah. climbing is such a mainstream sport. It's Olympic sport, you know, there's mm -hmm. gyms, it's, you know, you go to the, one of the gyms in in Boulder and it's full of like, you know, young, attractive Google executives who are like, right. you know, talking about, <laughs> like, you're just like, okay, it's just climbing. Yeah. It's like any, you know, um, so it's definitely changed a lot. The part of climbing, I mean, I love, I've obviously climbed my whole life. I love the athletic side of climbing and just the health and the all the the discipline and everything with it but i also love this the counterculture and the subculture and yeah. just deeper meaning of what it's all about yeah totally and the, and the kind of dirtbag culture like I've, I've spent so many camping trips like camped in the campground not showering for weeks and climbing right and there's something really special about the community that starts to form in that in those ways yeah yeah yeah. Is. Will you talk a little bit about, I want to talk about The Alpinist first. That's the last movie Ellen and I saw that just, um, well, actually Real Rock was the last movie. We'll talk about that too. But The Alpinist really shook me. Uh, will you tell us, just kind of give your high level of the movie, how you would describe it? Um, and then I want to talk about the character. Yeah. I mean, we we came across this, this climber, Marc-Andre Leclerc, who was completely unknown within the climbing community except for amongst like a very elite group of alpinists who knew what he was doing and i we heard about him and actually it was like at a party here in boulder and some guys were like you know getting drunk and they're like dude the people you filmed they're all a bunch of posers and blah 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 like this guy mark andre is the real deal and so we went and tracked him down and he was living in Canada. He was living in this little climbing community, Squamish, in a tent. Um, and he was going out and doing some of the biggest alpine solo climbs that anyone has ever done, which is sort of like the, the it's, an, it's one of the ultimate disciplines of climbing where it combines so many different skills and you have to have a knowledge of the mountain and be able to read the mountain in the different conditions. Yeah. And he was doing this stuff that was like, you know, he'll be in the history books a hundred years from now, but he wasn't even talking about it. And it right. was, you know, he was, he's a, he's a writer and he was writing his little blog, but it was so quirky and obscure and um, that like, it just was completely on the fringe. So there was this incredible dichotomy between what he was doing and then the absolute obscurity that he was doing it in. And so that was fascinating to me. And it gets back really? to just like the purity of the sport and doing it for these adventures. And so we spent, you know, a multi-year journey getting to know Mark and his girlfriend and his mom, who's an amazing person. And his whole family actually is amazing. 
and the climbing community up in Squamish. And we just followed him. It was interesting because we didn't really have a specific objective that he was after. He just was on this like life journey. And we're like, all right, let's, let's, let's follow it. And, um, you know, some, some amazing things happened during that time and, um, some tragedy happened as well. Yeah. And then, um, you know, we spent a couple more years just trying to process it ourselves. And we kind of stepped away from the film for six months and then we revisited and we're like, okay, how do we, how do we tell the story? We kind of, we captured this amazing young person, at this at the prime of his life and and then it just ended up being um you know a unique time in his life that yeah that we were lucky to be there for yeah it was so you guys did such an amazing job um and i one of my takeaways from mark andre was his um uh like my wife and i debriefed it and we each got something big from the the film and his sort of like a te- almost like a teaching from him, you know, which is like, yeah. I don't, I, I just want to blaze my own trail. And I, the thing I loved about him is like, I, I don't want to look at a map. I don't want to um, go where people have gone before. I just kind of want to go off trail and follow my intuition and my heart and just my instincts and see if I can do this thing. And I was like, dude, who does that? Like, it seems rare these days. Everyone wants to follow the main trail, so many people. And that was incredibly powerful for me. And then my wife, I think her big takeaway was something about him. Just, he was like, when you guys were like, Hey, we want to film you on this thing. And he's like, he, it was a phone call, I think. And he's like, I don't, and he ghosted you guys. <laughs> he like, yeah. And he was like, look, I, it's different when you're there it's different. And I, I want the pure experience of being by myself doing what I want to do. And it changes when cameras are there and a person's there. And I, I was like, right, that is so potent because, um, it, it does with our camp, with our phone in our pocket where we can take a selfie on the summit or a selfie along the way and kind of brag about what we're doing. He's just like, that changes it. And that, those two teachings were, were huge for us. Um, I'm curious what, was there something like that for you that he taught you or that you got out of it? Yeah, I love that. I mean, I love that you mentioned those, the, the second teaching is kind of, we, I kind of ended up building the entire structure and the entire film around that one quote. So and cool. what you say, it's like, well, if you were there, it wouldn't be a solo. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Which is kind of true. Right. <laughs> and I mean, it's funny because for us, you know, my partner, Nick Rosen and I were like, you know, made directed this film together. And, you know, we talk about in the film, we've been doing this for decades and we, you know, people in this community know us and we come in and here's this young guy who's just totally green. And there was this incredible process throughout the film of us becoming less and less the experts and <laughs> learn it, like just this letting go process of learning from Mark and him uh-huh showing us the way and it was always in this just quiet like sort of you know he's never debating but just like he had the way and yeah. then we were just on his path on the right and that, those layers just peeled during the filmmaking process and the thing with mark that like i mean i was get ah, mm. i was get a little emotional talking about mm-hmm. it. he's such a um Yeah, such a such a special mm-hmm. person. But <clears throat> the the thing with me, just like the the most powerful thing being around him was the um the simplicity of his life. Mm-hmm. And it was just this it was this um you know this visceral experience of like when you're around him, you just you got to just slow down and everything just like stops and he's just focused on a few things mm-hmm. and he he actually during that time we we're filming with him we realized and he never expressed this but he was focused on these ob- objectives that were three years or four years in the future 
and he everything he was doing was just these these steps building mm. up mm. these objectives. But he wasn't talking about that, and it wasn't like a list or it wasn't a thing. He just had these ideas, this this vision in his head of of what he wanted to do. He wanted to have the biggest adventures like that he could have on earth just yeah. the biggest like human powered solo walk out there and just have the biggest adventures possible and it, it did come from you know he read all the climbing literature and these history books and he was just on this journey towards towards these advent these ideas that mm -hmm. he had in his head and because they were so audacious there was just years and years of of practice and and steps that were leading to that journey and be, i don't know he was just so able to hold that in his head that everything else slipped away mm -hmm. you know that all that like there, you know he didn't do social media obviously he didn't do um he just like he, you know he didn't have sponsors he had a sponsor right. and then i actually know the guys pretty well that work at at arcteryx and they were like they were like they weren't even sponsored they were like dude we can't run ads with you because like no one even gets <laughs> like it just, we're we're selling jackets to like you know like moms in in vancouver we can't like <laughs> show you with your crazy hair and you know out there soloing something they were just like we just want to support you yeah and so he he just um he just lived mm -hmm. in this simple way yeah. and the more distractions you start taking away the the more distractions that start falling away and mm -hmm. then you just get down to the essence yeah and man i have like tried to change my life from my time with mark just mm. to be like you know like just try to be in that that state because it's a beautiful state to be in it's just yeah. you don't know where it's going to take you and it's very creative yeah. and it's um and i want to i'm like all right i'm almost 50 now like i want to be in that state as much mm -hmm. as possible um and i you know i tried to with my with our film projects like to to just think like think about okay what are where is this going and you know we we have some projects that you know do take four or five or six years and right. and it, it's nice it just so it's the opposite of like social media i guess would be yeah. the the antithesis where you're just like okay instant feedback like what do i do now what am i doing now what are they doing what how do i say that what was the response how do i respond to the response what and it's yeah. this feedback loop that is um it's 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 like addictive and and intense yeah. and it's not it's hard to get from that to like this mark andre state <laughs> yeah yeah it's so it's just so impressive on just how he lived in so many levels and so unusual um because a lot of young guys would want a lot of attention <laughs> yeah like look at me look at me um yeah anyway it's a really refreshing creature uh that you guys captured in such a beautiful way oh man yeah yeah I, I never i actually can i cannot watch films we've made in the past just because you never finish a film and you always uh -huh. ah, you're always wanting to tweak it yeah yeah but that film i watch just because i love mark so much and i just and you know i think he one of the things we did is we started using the we we, we call it verite when it's just like you're capturing like a wolf in the wild like it's just natural and you're just you know mm -hmm. they're and we started using his interview as verite um, because he would make, you know, he would he kind of spoke slowly and yep. he hadn't like, he had no pre-planned answers for every, anything. And so he'd make these incredible facial expressions trying to like really? think through his thoughts. And, and um, so I love watching that movie just because I love, I'm just like, oh, Mark. <laughs> like, yeah. so. for, for anyone that hasn't watched it, that's listening, that hopefully will go watch it what what would you want them to get out of it or how would i you don't know i it? mean i think it's so personal you know and I, I i think it's cool that like you said you and your wife you know came out with these with these sort of individual thoughts from it mm -hmm. uh, so i i don't know 
I mean, I've had so many conversations with people about it and um, yeah, I just think, I think, you know, a lot of people, I mean, just being a dad, I hang out with a lot of parents and I, I think his mom is like just the way she processed what he was doing and her way of supporting him and communicating with him is so powerful. Yeah. To people. And, yeah. Cool. Yeah. I mean, we'll let, let the listener here, um, obviously get out of it, whatever comes to them. Uh, it's, it's just very poignant. Hey y'all, I hope you have ordered my new book by now, Getting to Zero, How to Work Through Conflict in Your High Stakes Relationships. It's already getting dozens of five-star reviews on Amazon. I've heard from a lot of you. Thank you for buying the book, buying it on Audible, buying it on Kindle. Uh, I really appreciate it. Really appreciate the support. I think this book is going to help a lot of people. It's all about how do we get back to a good place after some kind of disconnection or rupture or conflict. That's what the entire book is about. And if you want a roadmap on how to get back to a good place, what I call zero, um, please order my book. Getting to zero book.com gets you some extra goodies, a conflict quiz, some additional PDFs, etc. And uh, you can order it in all the places and support your local bookstores. Cool. Thanks. Back to the show. Let me ask you a question about uh, it doesn't have to be about Mark, um, but about just some of your experience of climbers, mountaineers that push the em- envelope. And and one of my stories that I started to create in my experience with mountaineers in particular was, man, some of these guys, the only way they, they felt kind of depressed in their life and the only way they felt alive, and I'm generalizing, of course, this is just yeah. a few people I'm making conclusions off of, um, but are, are not like just feel kind of bogged down by life or their past and they go out and they push the envelope to feel alive, not just to find the flow states or kind of escape their life, but to feel because they feel dead in their life. So they feel alive because they're in touch with death. Like death is actually right, right up close. Yeah. Um, And then I, so I wonder about your thoughts on that. And then also you guys didn't go into, I've noticed the movies where you go into sort of childhood trauma, childhood history and interviewing parents. And it's obviously tough to get a parent to be like, yeah, I hit my kid or, you know, yeah. ignored my kid because every parent tries their best. Um, yeah. But I've seen different a- a- adventure films over the years and I've noticed it's delicate when you start going into the past stuff. But I, I know just as a therapist, psychologist kind of guy, coach who studies human beings for a living that like, I know there's a lot of cases of this, this is happening. Yeah. And yeah, I'm just curious how you walk that line as well as a filmmaker. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so I mean, I'm kind of hearing two questions, like yeah. just on the, the mentality, like are people doing this to like, to, to, feel you know, to basically be close to, to death and experience it. And I, I, I think that that is the case for some people, but not all. Mm-hmm. Um, I think the, um, I, I, the, the, I, I think kind of the three great soloists of the last generation. I say it's the great soloists because the soloing is really where you start, you know, getting into these, you know, more existential questions yeah. Yeah. <laughs> about why you're doing this because you can yeah. climb. Like I've, you know, I'm I solo a little bit when I'm climbing a lot, but it's very safe. And most climbers, to be clear, are you know just going out with ropes and with friends and they're following yeah. best practices and you can live a long life. And, you know, like I'm very excited to climb with my kids throughout my life yeah. and throughout their lives. You could, you could climb very safely, but these people who really go in the different direction, um, there's three guys who we, we've spent a ton of time filming with over the last couple decades. And one is Alex Honnold. One is Dean Potter and one is this Swiss guy named Uli Steck. And it's, I've really gone deep with all three of them. And, uh, you know, I, we spend a lot of time together. They've stayed, they stay at our house when they come to town. I, I stay with them when I'm filming and, you know, we've done interviews where we've mm-hmm. really gotten in there and I 
really we're trying to get inside their heads and understand what's yeah. driving them. And I've come to this, this realization that like those three guys are, they kind of represent like three, comp- they're all masters. I mean, the greats of mm-hmm. their generations, you know, it's like Kobe and LeBron and step like, you know, mm-hmm. these, and I think they've come to it from completely different places. Mm-hmm. Um, and like Alex Honnold, and I'm actually working on a film about him right now that we just shot a couple months ago. He did a big, like 36 hour solo link up of the entire oh, yeah. Red Fox formation out in, mm-hmm. out in Nevada, which is pretty, pretty wild. And he just, he comes from this hyper analytical um, perspective. And he, you know, definitely has some control over his amygdala and his his fear. Oh and he's God. just like, he's such a rash. He's like so hyper rational that there this whole conversation about death and stuff is not, it's just, it's not his conversation. Yeah. He's just like a super fanatical climber. He found it when he was young. He became obsessed. I mean, he basically when he was like 13 started riding his bike from school to the climbing gym. And he would just stay there from like three in the afternoon in Sacramento till like 10 at night, he would do his homework between climbs and then, you know, ride his bike home. And he's just like super obsessed. And he doesn't, he's not having, like, he doesn't have to enter this alternate, uh, this mindset. Yeah. Uh, I was, I was filming him on um, this thing, Moonlight Buttress, which is this five, 12 D a thousand foot, you know, finger crack that he free soloed that at the time was like the craziest thing anyone had free soloed. And he gets up there into the crux pitch and I'm hanging next to him. And I was so scared. I mean, it was, I, I was like, I can't believe I'm here. Like this, if this guy falls, you know, he was 19 or 20 at the time, like if this guy falls, it's going to be, and he gets up there and he's just on his fingertips. And then, he kind of like chalks ha- chalks up and he's moving slowly. And then he looks at me and he's like, he's like, do you want me to like pretend this is scary? Or like, do you want me to like breathe hard or something? <laughs> I was so disarmed. I was like, dude, what are you talking about? Like <laughs> stay focused. Insane. And you know, he puts a knee bar in where you can kind of like jam your knee into the rock and hang. And then he takes both hands off and he's like, Woo, look at this cool position, you know? And I'm just like, dude, this is unbelievable. Yeah. Um, Dean Potter, who is, you know, he's, he was w- one of the greats. I yeah. mean, kind of the great of his generation. He died in a base jumping accident. Yeah, um, I remember that. About six or seven years ago. And he was the, and he and Honnold were kind of competitive. They both spent a lot of time in Yosemite and he was the opposite. He would, and I mean, I was with Dean on, many of his sort of big climbs and he would he was really into yoga and meditation and just like a spiritual practice Mm -hmm. and he would get really scared and there was this intense energy but he was so driven and that you know going into childhood and stuff like he was so driven to do this stuff and to be the best he would do these like deep breathing practices Mm -hmm. Yeah. <sighs> and then you just didn't you wanted to just not move and then he right. would do these things and he would achieve these you know almost like you could almost call them stunts because they were just these like incredible things and then he there would be this like like visceral release of energy ah yeah at the top and you know like and it was complete and alex was like dude what is dean doing that's crazy you know why is it so intense <laughs> you uh-huh. know and so these two guys were so different. And then Uli Steck was interesting because he grew up in Interlaken, in Switzerland. And that guy was like walking up the sides of mountains when he was like two years old, mm-hmm. you know, like doing stuff just, and he just grew up on the side of a mountain and he became so physically comfortable in the Alpine environment in a way that like, I've never seen another human. Mm. He famously soloed. We made a film about him called The Swiss Machine. We called him The Swiss Machine. Uh-huh. Cause I haven't seen this one. Him. And he, you know, he soloed the north face of the Eiger in winter 
in like, you know, which usually takes three days, you know, ba- like t- you sleep up there and you bring the gear and he did it in like two and a half hours. <laughs> you know, it was like, it was one of those things when he did it, the whole world was just like, what? Like it what wasn't just even, right. uh, yeah, like what just happened. And, um, and he just was like, you know, almost more in the, it wasn't like Honnold, like where he didn't understand the consequence. Like he, he just, he didn't like rationalize the consequences. He just was so comfortable in that environment yeah. that it just, it was, it was a different body mind connection to, to that mm-hmm. space that I just have never seen in someone. Well, uh, it almost sounds like a, he was like a natural animal out in the, just doing his thing. He was like a, he was like a mountain goat. Yeah. yeah. It just absolutely. Mm. I think it's so individual for it, for everyone. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. Hey, if you want to uplevel your life, your relationship life specifically, I want you to consider our relationship mastery program. It's nine months of complete transformation where you become a better listener, a better communicator. You learn how to have secure relationships and you get an experiential taste of that. You feel seen and supported and challenged to reach your relationship goals. And really you become a better communicator. So many, many people have gone through this course now. And we have a done with you version of it now, which is amazing, where you get assigned a private relationship coach. You get to do live group coaching with me once a month and ask me anything you want. There's office hours where you get to meet with one of our coaches to nerd out on the curriculum. And the community is very strong. And these are people who care a lot about relationships and they want to get what they want to get, which is they want to be in a relationship and not betray themselves, right? They want to get the relationship they want while being true to themselves. That's what most of us want. And this course is the path for you to get that. Here's what one of our participants in the past has said about this course. What I would say to people that have been listening to the podcast but aren't ready to take that final step into joining the course, um, the most powerful thing has been like the partner calls. The accountability um, is something that you're not going to get by just listening to podcasts on your own because I thought the same thing like, oh, I'm getting a lot out of just listening to these podcasts and I'm, you know, mm-hmm. been in therapy. I've, you know, done this and that. Um, to take that deeper dive and the commitment There's something about just the financial commitment, the time and the energy that you put into it. What you put in is what you're going to get out of it. And so, again, if, you know, invest in yourself. All right. Amazing words from one of our heartfelt students here at the Relationship School. If you want to change your life like they did, go to relationshipschool.com forward slash relationship mastery, and we'll see you in there. Are women climbers any different than the women that are, that are pushing the envelope? Is it similar where it's just like each woman has a unique flavor? We can't lump them into a troubled past and then they decide to escape that through climbing or something. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the women, there aren't as many women who are pushing the super dangerous mm-hmm. stuff. And I mean, the women, you know, there's so many amazing women climbers now. And I actually think there may be more women climbers than men now. Like when I go to the gym and I often Mm -hmm. count because it's so different than when I'm growing up. And there are almost every time I'm at one of the gyms, there's more women than men and out at the local crags and stuff. Yeah. And the level that women are achieving is amazing. Um, I mean, I think of Steph Davis, who's... You know, she's, she really like back, like around the turn of the century was like the, the dominant female climber. And she's, you know, free solo of the diamond. Um, Actually, Nina Williams, just free solo of the diamond. And she does these high ball boulder problems. And I, there's, there's not, um, there's just not such a um, wide spectrum Mm -hmm. of women who are really doing the, the dangerous stuff. But I think in in general the um you know I, the the women are just they're they're methodical. Mm-hmm. I just I, I I the the women I know who are climbing at that level they're all like just methodical and um just rising through the steps and building yeah. the building the groundwork. Right. Yeah, yeah. So. I loved seeing the in Real Rock um the last Real Rock here in Boulder. At the show I, I saw uh, with my kids, or with Lucian anyway, um, I love seeing the couple climb that huge yeah. tower 
and yeah. and now you guys got them like kissing and they'd be like okay honey you're you're on belay now like go for it and there's something really sweet too about uh just a couple that's that strong and i don't know that was there was something i was like god i got it i want to interview them about their relationship oh like, my gosh good how luck do you guys do this um yeah yeah, anyway. yeah. well they're austrian so yeah. they're like you know, almost like stereotypically Aus Austrian in that they're just very, their emotions are very under the surface yeah. and, you More know, so. they're very super methodical. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. Excellent work. Now it's my turn. Uh -huh. <laughs> and so, yeah. yeah, we tried to go deeper into the relationship and it was just like, yeah, they're keep, they keep it pretty, pretty simple. Okay. <laughs> so. yeah, that was cute. Uh, yeah. Tell us, tell us about Re Real Rock uh, Seventeen. Um, you started this uh, almost two decades ago. Yeah. What, what's the sort of focus there? Uh, and this was really powerful, particularly the um, Israeli-Palestinian film. I, I was in tears several times through that one. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, Real Rock. Like I started making climbing films in my twenties when I was um, just climbing a lot and yeah. wanted to be creative, and it's like could do stuff on the cheap and stuff and, and then kind of, you know, built a, a little bit of a reputation within the climbing community. And then that has just expanded that community and this, everything connected to it has expanded so much. Um, and real rock was, uh, um, you know, it's a, it was built between me and a couple other filmmakers, Nick Rosen and Josh Lowell. And it was, you know, we basically, wanted to have an annual showcase of our new films because it's super fun to show them on tour in yeah. person and to get the community together and and um so it kind of you know like many things we do it just kind of started out ragtag and then it built quickly and we set it up so people could license the program and they could kind of individualize the experience for for their own community and you know, I think our last year before the pandemic, we did like close to a thousand shows across wow. the world. Um, and, That's you know, some of those are like just, it, you know, a hundred people in a climbing gym and in like, I don't know, South Korea. And then others are, you know, big theaters and stuff like what we do in Boulder here. Yeah. And, um, but it's really about like storytelling. And yeah. I mean, all our films are storytelling. We use, we use climbing as the, as the medium and, you know, climbing is an incredible, um, it's incredible medium to be working in because you have this built in story of the, you know, people have these objectives and they have these obstacles that they yeah. need to, you know, like any superhero movie, you're like, Oh, I got to save the world. And then here's the obstacles I have to overcome to do. It. Yeah. And then you have these incredible relationships, you know, and I think like within the climbing, climbing films, there's all these sort of sub genres like the buddy film or the, you know, the, the expedition or the, you know, there's, yeah. There's, there's all these fun things. So it's just continued. And we have a, you know, a group of a group of us that make the films every year. They're all short films. And so this is our 17th year doing it. Um, and we're just always looking for something new. And yeah. we want to tell, um, you know, this different stories that this year there's, um, you know, there's one 25 minute film about this guy, Seb Buin, who's French, who yeah, does the hardest, the hardest climb that anyone has ever done. And that one's great because we went out to film the climb and in, in the Verdun Gorge in France. And then just, you know, we happened to meet Seb's mom. <laughs> oh my God, that made that made the whole movie. <laughs> it makes the whole movie, right? Because you know? she's this incredible character and she, yeah. you're just like, what? And so, you know, it, the fun thing with the real rock films is, um, you know, we always have, we can always shift. We can always just, they can just evolve. It's not like when we do stuff for, you know, a big uh, streamer or something where you've, you know, you've, you've kind of set up what you're going to do and then you uh -huh. go out and do it. And um, yeah. And then there was a film, you know, there's a young guy, Tim Brun, who lives here in Boulder, who's, um, you know, spent his life since age 19 trying to, trying to bring climbing to Palestine. And, um, you know, he, he went there and he oh, just geez. felt like he was just devastated by the, by the living conditions. And, you know, it's a, it's a brutal place and, 
you know, as Jimmy Carter said, it's an, it's basically an apartheid that they're, mm-hmm. that they're living in there. And, um, and he was just like, they need, like, everyone has the right to, to joy. <laughs> basically <Yeah>. was <laughs> his premise and he didn't want to get into the politics. He didn't, he's not trying to like, he was just like, there's awesome rock here. And like, they need to, we need to build a climbing community. And he spent the last 10 years doing it. And I mean, it is such a tear jerking. Oh, it's so moving. Film. And you just, it, you know, cause we all, I think we all have this thing, especially in Boulder and, you know, everyone gets obsessed about like their next grade and stuff. And you're like, oh, this is just like, like, you know, kind of a little bit of like rich white people, um, like climbing is like, it's, it's so meaningful to us, you know, the, those of us who like already have whatever. And it's so cool to see that like, yeah, it's, it's, I guess it's meaningful to us, but it's like really meaningful when it's all you have. Yeah. And it's like, it, that's actually when it becomes um, what it's all, you know, yeah. much, much more important. So I think that that, that was helps. super cool storytelling there. Hey there, every week I send out an email toward the end of the week giving you a tip or a pointer on personal growth, psychology, communication, and of course, relationships. If you want to receive that, go to relationshipschool.com forward slash newsletter and make sure you're on my list so that I can send you these emails. I think they're awesome, high quality content coming your way. Just with the time left, how, how do you, I'm curious how you think about the creative process and God, I, I have so many questions for you here, but maybe we start there. Just being a yeah. filmmaker seemed like your undergrad was like in geology or something. And then you decided to go pursue art. And yeah. I'm so curious what had you, maybe I'm, let me back up and ask this question first. What had you pursue art? Uh, because so many, you might've heard what I heard when I was an art major actually, which was, you can't make money as an artist. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I'm curious yeah, what had yeah. you go for it? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I studied geology as an undergrad at Colorado college. Um, because I love rocks yeah. <laughs> not because I, I had any career ambitions in like yeah. in anything in the sciences. And I always knew I was going to, I mean, I just, you know, I was never like, I don't know. I always knew I'd do something kind of fun and out of the box just cause that's like kind of my personality it's, okay. has always been like just doing my own thing. <laughs> more. Yeah. I don't know if we could go deeper into that probably, <laughs> but, um, and then, yeah, and then I went back, went to film school in LA at, at USC film school. And that, that school actually I chose because it is, you know, USC is, is known as like the most sort of connected to the industry. And there's so many famous people who have gone mm. through that. And um, so it was somewhat, you know, it was a few years after college and it was somewhat um, uh, actually with the idea of like, I want to, I want to make it in the industry, you know, mm-hmm. I want to. I want to be, I want to be successful. It was very different than I think than like going to, um, you know, there's other film schools that are just much more artsy and and Mm. art art focused. And, you know, you meet, you make a lot of connections there and stuff. And, you know, I, I, I think what I came out of there with was just like, like, like you're so close when you're at that school in LA and you have all these famous directors and producers coming in and talking to you and stuff you're just like oh it's not that big a gap between uh-huh. between us and them and you have you know classmates selling their scripts and you know uh, there's obviously a lot of like people who go to that school who are just like the sons and daughters of you know super sure. famous people and they're gonna go act or do something um so i uh I, wait, what was the question? <laughs> what had you go for it with art? Because so many yeah, artists yeah, yeah, yeah. get discouraged because it's like, you can't make money as an artist or, oh yeah, you should keep that as a yeah. hobby. And you went for it. Yeah. Yeah. And it's interesting. Film is like, fi- yeah, film. I mean, it is like the entertainment industry is the biggest employer in the state of California. You know, like it, it there are so many jobs in the entertainment industry. Uh-huh. And I know like, so many people from film school or friends who like wanted to be photographers and got into filmmaking, like who have really successful careers in the film TV media um, industry. And I I think there is a lot of room for so many different types of people Um, because going actually, this is going to your bigger question about like the creative process. Yeah. 
which <clears throat> films are that like you everyone always says this but unless you do it you can't under you can't fully appreciate this uh-huh. but like films are so collaborative and there are so many people that need to be there's just so you know you're dealing with 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 music you're dealing with with interviews you're dealing with footage and capturing creating all that and then putting it all together into a cohesive way and then you're dealing with like distribution and you yeah. know and marketing and all that stuff there's so many people that need to be involved in any one film that um there's just room for a lot of mm. different types of people and you know you maybe you're like a total um like you 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 hate talking to people and you just want to like sit in front of your computer there's a there's great jobs for you in the film yeah. world you yeah. know or you like you never want to sit at your computer and you just want to be out exploring the world all the time we have we probably both know a lot of people who have great careers just yeah. you know like like going to these amazing places and shooting and working super hard and um so i think uh yeah I'm hearing that you felt like you, you kind of had a lot of, there was a lot of permission and support around the environment you chose that it wasn't like some big barrier you had to get over in yourself or something. No. And I, honestly, the hardest thing in the film world for me, and I, I, I've talked to other people about this, is like, is, is, is knowing what you want to do. And there's so many opportunities to be like, like if you're motivated and, you know, have and like can kind of figure stuff out like you're going to get all asked to like work on other people's films or like to go shoot this or to do that and and knowing what you want to do and sort of mm. you know doing your own projects which has always been the biggest thing for me is right. like I want to direct and I want to make like the kinds of films that I want to make and doing that is is it's a longer timeline and you have to kind of go through a bunch of like onerous steps to get there. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's hard to, um, it's, it's important to just not get distracted. And yeah, especially like, with social media and what everyone else is doing and all that shit. <laughs> <laughs> totally, totally, totally. Okay. A couple more quick rapid fire questions. Um, yeah. Yeah. dude, I'm totally fine to go for, I know I've been rambling. I'm sorry. Yeah, no, it's great. It's great. Um, what, what um, advice would you give to a creative who's a little stuck right now? When like, like when you get stuck oh, or yeah, when your yeah, friends yeah. get stuck creatively, like what, what do you do? Yes, I have great advice for this actually, which is give it to someone else to give feedback. Mm. Get feedback. Get out of your like, solo, I, isolated sort of heady. Yep. That's my, my number one thing I've noticed with people who, and we have a lot of young people work with us and just a lot of, you know, we're working with like six freelance editors on different projects right now. And people always want to go further before they want to share something and mm-hmm. get feedback. And it's, it's unbelievable when someone gives you feedback, it like immediately starts unlocking. Wow. Everything. Like, and you don't That's even, so cool. like even... And it's not, it's usually, it's often, it's it, what, like, like, cause I do the same, I mean, we all do it, right? You like, you're like, Hey, do you want to read this thing I wrote? And then you're like yeah. trying to get it cleaned up and stuff. And sometimes it's like someone, you know, people often, you know, in the film industry, they say always like make a nice sandwich, like say something nice, <laughs> ease into your critique and then finish with something nice. Right. Yeah. And often that nice thing that someone says, it'll be a threat. You're just like, they're like, yeah, you know, I really liked the way you, um, you treated your brother in that, in that, in this, he's, I really liked him. And you're like, wait, what? That's my, you know, like uh-huh. mind blowing. So. Okay, cool. I think just, man, I can't like Get feedback. Everyone waits too long to get feedback. Yeah. Okay. Let's back it up one step and say the person is, I'll use myself as an example. Let's say I am, well, I am, (laughs) to be even more honest here, uh, going through a little process myself with my creativity. Um, I've got my next book idea. um, I'm, but I like creativity, it feels like is stalled out in some way. So it's not like I don't have anything to share to give feedback, to get feedback on. So if if a person like me is in a- What's your next book idea? Uh, it's about needs. 
about about needs needs human needs yeah and what is what what do you mean uh you know maslow's hierarchy of needs uh, yeah, yeah. I remember so still. redoing redoing maslow's hierarchy of needs because it's way outdated ah yeah ah. So you're saying like re re yeah like, like it's, is that it's a just, it's got to change because it's just it's out it's from the 50s and why do you want to do that uh because i feel like um I, there's two reasons. One, I have a problem to solve. I'm like wrestling with this thing. Like there's something I'm learning through the process that I'm like, I've got to figure it out. And it feels, um, exciting because I feel like it's so new and interesting to me. That's number one. Number two is I know it's going to help people. And so what, how are you stuck? Um, well, well, that's a good question. Um, because I'm not, I'm not doing that project very much. I'm, I'm spending a few hours a week on that. I'm running a business and I'm running my social media accounts and I'm doing all this other stuff. Um, do you have, are you like, when are you like on Monday? Are you like, okay, this week I'm going to carve out like this amount of time to just sit and work on that. And then you don't get to it. Or is it like you're putting it off because you don't know what it is? That's a good question. I'm, I feel like I'm like, I have all day tomorrow. I, I'm like, my Friday is completely free, yeah. but it's not free to work on this. It's to work on, that's interesting. It's work to work on maybe other things. Um, like life things like. No, but, but writing, mostly writing, writing and creating content. Um, uh-huh. Right. Right. See, I think you're battling the, the immediate and the, this like, it all kind of goes back to Marc Andre. Like there's the immediate and then there's the, the longer, like the bigger, longer term goals. Right. So I think what you're kind of coaching me here on, thanks for the session, by the way, <laughs> I'm not trying to here, <laughs> um, is, is you're basically saying I, I should be focused on this really interesting project and not getting distracted and just and, and play the long game there and just be like, yeah, just chip away at this really interesting book idea and see where it goes. Yeah. And well, I'm not saying you should because I'm not, yeah. I, don't, I don't have enough information get that. to tell you that. But I think if that is something that like is eating you up and you feel it and you want to do it. Um, one other thing that we do, because we do the same thing. We we're on this annual cycle with, real rock and we're constantly making these short films yeah um we have uh we just set up like a three-part series at hbo that we've been you know trying to get to we finally like pitched it this summer oh, nice. and it's going to be a multi-year project that okay. that we're working on and those things are so daunting like you see the ending and you like right the inspiration is the is like oh, it's going to be this like you said it's restructuring this iconic thing in a way that like actually changes people's lives and helps people yeah. that more fit to the, to our modern times, which sounds amazing. I'm like, I love it. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I totally get, I totally get it. And, but that is, there's so many steps to that process to, to getting to there. And then can you break that down mm -hmm. into like, small right, small goals. chunks that i can do we I, this i mean i live in beat sheets uh -huh. so this like my life is is beat sheets my <laughs> okay. i just i love is that like trello or something i don't know what beat sheets is yeah i mean it's kind of an outline but it's like uh -huh. it, i mean you the cool thing and they can be really simple or really but it's like a bullet point and it's, you know, it's just a word or a short sentence of like the big ideas. Yeah. And you start putting those on a paper and then you start, you know, they, you can put even, you know, sub beats under there about like yeah. the things about that, that, that it's like a chapter or it's a subject matter or it's one of the things. And then those things start taking that starts taking a shape. Mm -hmm. so, um, Nick, my partner, Nick Rosen and I have been 
we live we it's a verb to us beat sheeting on this this next big project and it's going to be a three three one hour episodes and um we've been beat sheeting for six months wow. and it's like and it's funny because we're going to be going out next month to do the interviews and all the interviews that we're doing are going to be based off of this this mm-hmm. beach but it's a nice tangible step yeah. you know yeah and then because the nice thing about the beach sheet is then if you can be like if you want to actually start writing you can be like okay this is these are the three beats that are like that i totally get and this is the stuff mm-hmm. i need to think through and then you just you can it kind of frees you up to to start writing about a specific thing without having to you get the gist of how it fits into the whole thing but it doesn't um you don't have to like flow into and out of it and you know i don't know i'm yeah that's no it's helpful that's great particularly just just your questioning around well what are you you know what are you doing and what do you suck on them and uh anyway it's just the questioning and then the beat sheets and it reminding me of mark andre it yeah. sounds like a classic creative creatives, uh, creative persons conundrum, which uh-huh. is the, the big, the the big and the and the stuff in your face. Yeah, and um and just juggling those two because you don't want to just do the big, right? Yeah. You got a family, you got a podcast, you got a business, <laughs> like yeah. you have a whole thing. Going. You have the here and now, and you don't, you know, you're not like okay, I'm taking a sabbatical from everything for two years to do the big, but yeah, no. You got to find a way to, to keep, I do fight inertia on the big, but Mm -hmm. stay in the present. That's the, that's the, that's the creative process right there. There you go. Yeah. Thank you. About the creative process. Nice man. You should write a book about that. (laughs) Oh my gosh. Yeah. I'll put a movie about that. (laughs) That's cool. Well, uh, Pete, it's been awesome. Uh, where can people find you and your films and, um, yeah, just where can people yeah. get hooked up with Real Rock and all that? Yeah, so our our um, you know, we do these longer longer form films like like The Alpinist is on Netflix. Um, the Dawn Wall is was the one we made before that with Tommy, which Caldwell. is amazing, which we didn't even talk about, which is incredible. Yeah, yeah, he's uh, Tommy <laughs> awesome. He lives in Estes. He's, yeah, um, I'm sure a lot of your listeners know have have met him and. Um, another incredible person that I, it was on Netflix. I think it's on Amazon now. I'm not sure. Actually, it, it kind of moves around. And yeah. then, um, and then we have a, yeah, we do have this series. It's actually about Dean Potter and it's called the dark wizard mm-hmm. that we're making for HBO. That's going to, it won't be out for a okay. while. I'm really, it's going to be next level we're really excited about that cool um, okay. and then and then real rock we have a we started a streaming platform a subscription platform for real rock it's called real rock unlimited and it has all the films we've made over the last 25 years mm-hmm. and it's become enough of a thing that we are actually um licensing films from other filmmakers so um, cool. and bringing them onto the platform and we've got a bunch of subscribers and we're launching real rock 17 on there on april 20th so if this already if this comes out after april 20th it's on there yeah it, which it will and people will be able to grab that and wh- where do they go real rock.com yeah just it's real rock tour.com and then you can uh, okay click, click link or you can just go it's called real rock unlimited um, it. and it's real r-e-e-l rock r-e-e tour.com okay yeah, rentlocktoy.com. Yeah. Amazing. And you're not, I noticed you're not even on social, but you're, uh, uh, you are kind of in a way with real rock and stuff. You, you're like this hidden guy a little bit. You're not like, there's no Pete <laughs> Mortimer at handle. Is that right? Well, it's funny because there's a, there's, I guess, a, a pretty successful ultra runner now called Peter Mortimer has yeah. my same. I, I bumped into that on online on social. Yeah. And so people are like, <laughs> like dude, could, dude i you didn't know, know you're a runner crazy to think that i'm <laughs> would be a runner too just because of the world i worlds i run i i yeah. run it. um so i get complimented for all these uh races that i win yeah, nice <laughs> well, dude, great. 
don't even have to show up. <laughs> thanks for taking the extra time. Uh, really appreciate it. Um, thanks for all your creativity and filmmaking and to the, the friends you collaborate with. It's, it's amazing. Oh man. Thanks for the conversation. This is super fun. Really? Yeah. Really. yeah. Cool. Yeah. We'll do it in all person right. sometime. All right. To be continued. Yeah, we'll go, uh, let's go climbing. Hey, quick interruption here. Imagine a career that draws on your passion for personal growth and relationships, that harnesses your ability to support, challenge, and connect with others, that helps you develop as a person while you help others at the same time. What if you could earn a living while making an impact on thousands of people's lives and even on the future of society and how we treat each other? It'd be pretty cool, right? Well, that job does exist. It's the job of a relationship coach, and I believe that the relationship coaches in the world are going to play a crucial role in the future of our culture not only in the U.S., but abroad. Well, you know, one in two marriages still ends in divorce. Three out of five Americans are lonely. We've got a serious loneliness epidemic and a looming mental health crisis that's, I think, already here. Um, couples that do well live 10 years longer than couples that don't, okay? Um, according to the Gottmans, 80% 80, 80 of couples are headed in the direction of divorce within their first four to five years of marriage. Yikes! Okay, relationship stress is chronic disease. Um, it it's, creates chronic disease, in my opinion, um, from what I've read and the research I understand. Uh, I think it really hurts people everywhere. And uh, I think the only way to really address this relationship, you could say relationship crisis, really, because we, we, it looks like a mental health crisis, it looks like a loneliness crisis, but we have to ask why. What is the root of this? Well, possibly how we raise kids. Possibly it's how we treat each other in our intimate, closest relationships. And the bottom line here is that people need help. They need your help. And our relationship coaches are slowly growing their businesses and doing well and feeling fulfilled and like they have a meaningful purpose and career where they get to work for themselves. So if you want to come be a part of this amazing um, training, you can apply right now. We're taking applications Um that's open currently and go to relationshipschool.com forward slash RCT if you want to apply and get an interview. Um, we do offer a portion um, of scholarships to people that enroll if money is an issue and it's a big investment. But if you think of the return on the investment, uh, what you get out of this training, you are going to transform as a person, as an individual, and you're going to become a better partner, better parent, etc. And you're going to learn how to effectively help people with their relationship challenges, thus leading to less loneliness, perhaps, and less mental health challenges for people out there. Okay, so come apply for our amazing training, relationshipschool.com forward slash RCT. Oh.